Okay, ready to go. So, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Any German guys here? Deutsch? Uh, French. French, okay. <laughs> so, no German guys here. Um, <laughs> so, we have to do it in English. Uh, <laughs> so, otherwise, you will not follow our the presentation. So, my name is Oliver Lombeck. I'm from Static Systems, systems engineer covering uh, the central part of Germany and uh, mainly taking care about the channel partners in Germany. So most of the time about customer facing, only a few times visiting Jack, for example, <laughs> in Holland. Uh, but um, for fun. So with me is my colleague, Ron. Ron yeah. My name is Ron Grass. Um, I have the same role as Oliver. I'm in his team. On doing all the virtualization products within Citrix, Xenax, and the Esther provisioning services for our partners on the channel business too. So maybe we can tell you today something about a new product called Gateway Express and Enterprise. Hope you enjoy it. That's a lie. It's <laughs> not a new product, it's, it's a current product, and we will see an upcoming release this year. So we will cover I think, both parts and can even show you some new parts which will be in the next release and some cool new stuff and cool features regarding mobile device management, mobile app management, and how it works all together and how it fits in our, in our story um, with mobile work styles. So, um, we will cover some basics using PowerPoint slides and then switch off uh, or jump to our lab in, in Hardware Most near Munich and doing a live part from the installation, configuration, um, Storefront services, the app controller, and even the, the Access Gateway Enterprise or NetScaler part with all the policies, session profiles, and all the different things you need to be aware of when configuring it. So let's start. So it's um, the marketing stuff. Our goal is for employees to be as productive uh, on the go as they are in the office. So it's, it's true because we changed a lot of things regarding the receiver part for the customer, how the configuration can be done for the receivers, for the different type of receivers. And the other part is the data center where all the applications, desktops, um, even if it's Windows apps, if it's uh, mobile apps, um, can be delivered to the end user using the receiver. So, what is it? It's uh, Cloud Gateway is a single product name which covers uh, many, many different components. We have to use the Exos Gateway or the Gateway Services. And are you aware that we uh, announced the end of life and of sales of Exos Gateway Standard Edition and Exos Gateway Advanced Edition? So Exos Gateway will consist mainly only on the Netscaler builds with a different license. We can see in the console only a few things from Netscaler for configuring the ICA proxy, SSL, VPN, certificate management and everything. And it's it's much cooler than the access gateway was before. And it's even more reliable and um, more powerful to do things with the different receivers and even filter things or do client-less policy scans to, to get, for example, jailbreak devices, rooted devices and all this kind of stuff. Access Gateway Enterprise is uh, more powerful, as already said, uh, less latency, that's the main thing. Uh, you can do a lot of cool stuff with it. Um, you'll see what you have to do to access from all areas over the world, because the world, the world gets more and more mobile. Yeah, it's all about work shifting, working from everywhere. That's a strategy from Citrix since years. And this is another thing we will add performance, user experience, for the users uh, with, with this product. And for us, it's even better to only maintain one product line, and not product line Xscape Standard and product line Xscape Enterprise. So covering the gateway services for external access, then the main component we need for providing all different kinds of apps and content to the user is um, or are storefront services. Storefront services is a Windows application based on IIS, running on Windows Server 2008 R2 with IIS 7.5. So it's the replacement of the good old, well-known web interface. And web interface is even end of life, 
in the year 2014 because it relies on J Sharp and Microsoft announced the end of life for J Sharp at 2014 or 2015, I think. And the support for Windows 8? It's not working, right? It's uh, no, it's what? not working. It, it, or it, it, it really depends with, with, which uh, receiver you're using uh, on, on Windows 8 because there are currently two different receivers you can use on Windows 8, and we will cover it later on. Okay. So we need the software and services, and at the back, um, we need the different content controllers. And the content controller can be of course, Xenon Windows and Desktop for providing Windows apps and Windows desktops. Can be Web and SaaS apps, data, the share file integration, and even mobile apps. And all the three lower parts, Web, SaaS, data, and mobile, will be covered um, by the app controller. So this is the second component, the app controller. It's a Linux-based appliance, which currently exists for um, Xen server, for VMware and I don't know if it's also available for Hyper-V at the moment. So these are the main components for Cloud Gateway. So, oh, it's normally gray. <laughs> <laughs> it's looking a little bit strange on, on the beam. So um, that's um, the big picture of what we can do on the client side with all the different receivers, with all the different mobile devices. And um, store and services, the app controller, and even the um, oops, no. <laughs> uh, and even the access gateway will take care of the identity enforcement, the policy enforcement, and the security. So it's the good old smart access that's behind. So we can see who's coming, which, which device, um, so the current condition, and then enforce a policy to provide access to certain applications or to, to, to provide access or, or to, 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 to steer what um, can be done with the applications. When talking about Cloud Gateway, um, Cloud Gateway is available in two different editions. So it's a Cloud Gateway Express, which is free, which only covers the Windows component for providing access to Xenap and the desktop. It's a Cloud Gateway Enterprise, which is a commercial product which you have to buy in um, device or user licensing or even concurrent licensing. And Cloud Gateway with share file is not a separate product. It just means if you would like to use the data integration, you have to buy share file with a separate license. So the share file is not included in Cloud Gateway you, uh, if you would like to, to use um, the data or doc integration you have to buy a share file separately, either on-premise or hosted in the cloud. So this is the big picture. The user has to use the receiver, and the receiver is getting stronger and stronger, and it's the main component, and he's also taking care for all the different things regarding the policy enforcement. So if you would like to limit a mobile app, that um, the mobile app can only be launched if the user has authorized this mobile app, which you can deploy by using Cloud Gateway. It has to contact the receiver. The receiver will contact back in the data center to the app controller. The app controller will check if you are still in the group which is authorized for launching the app, or for checking the policy if you are um, using <coughs> a network or root device. Um, and then the receiver is talking back to the mobile app, to the native app and um, we'll give all the information back to the, to the mobile app and, and say uh, you are allowed to launch the mobile app or even not if the, the conditions are not fulfilled. Access Gateway, the cool thing about Access Gateway is um, that we in most cases do not need to use SSL VPN. So it's all taking place clientless by just using the ICA proxy. No configuration for any um, client device, certificate handling, anything else. And the good news is that we will extend it with the mobile devices running on Android or even on iOS that we will um, use a micro VPN or what we will call secure browse on iOS which is similar to the micro VPN on Android devices for establishing a tunnel, SSL based tunnel into the back end and then we can limit the tunnel that for example a native mobile app can only talk to certain applications over certain ports in the backend. 
So it's like a kind of firewalling inside the tunnel. Storefront services are connected to the different app controllers, and the app controller is providing the content for the mobile apps, web to SaaS apps, and even for the share file content, the data. So from a technical point of view, um, I think that most of you know this picture where to place access gateway in your DMZ and put the storefront service and even the app controller in the internet. Because the cool thing on it with it is um, that the mechanism how the user connects to storefront, even internal or, or if it is internal or even externally, storefront tr tries to detect um, the condition. Are you internally? Then you need only to log on by just providing your username and password. And if you are log trying to log in on uh, externally, you have to use, for example, username, password, and one-time password because you need strong authentication if you try to connect externally. So that's why we use the beacon services for signaling that you are on-premise or, for example, off-premise. Um, and it's working pretty well. And there are some intermediate states which we also can detect, for example, if you're like here in a hotel internet, you have to um, log on to a proxy, which only a minimum of internet access. It will pop up first with the proxy authentication and then with your authentication to the access gateway or to the backend. The Citrix receiver. Um, receiver is getting better and better uh, and even similar across all platforms because currently most of the features are implemented on the Windows platform. We try to provide the same behavior to other platforms. The first big shift was with the Linux receiver, where we also provided the flash acceleration with uh, flash version 2. And we will even provide, for example, workspace control for iOS devices with the next release or with upcoming releases, for example. Oliver, this is an interactive slide because it's frightening. Blackberry is vanishing like in the real world. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, in the next couple of weeks we will see an upcoming release of the iOS and even the Android receiver, which is working very well. Um, Blackberry, there are currently only a few customers with Blackberry and it's getting less and less. Chrome OS is a growing market. Mac OS is a huge market with uh, a, a huge momentum. Uh, and even Windows is um, currently the strongest uh, participant in the market. And even Windows 8 is, I think, a challenge, especially for customers. Do you know any customers who are willing to shift to Windows 8? No? Only on tablets when looking. Yeah. Only on tablets. Yeah. But that's Not only for just, laptops, no. desktops, and everything. According to Microsoft, yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they already, already sold. Four million. Four, four million. Four million. Four yeah, four licenses, licenses. licenses. But nobody's using them. Yeah. <laughs> Shelfware. <Yeah. laughs> so it's really a nightmare. Um, the good news is that you can even test it with receiver. And the Windows 8 VDA virtual desktop agent is already there. We just launched it on 1st of November. And we are even running it in our demo center that you can try to, to, to get access to Windows Edit on an iOS device like an iPad, for example. So, the different kind of apps and what can be done. Um, I think that most of you are using Windows-based applications in the corporate uh, or Windows desktops. Um, who's using the mobility pack? Okay, only a few. That's really great. Um, I think that that's pretty cool to work with Windows apps on a mobile device, touch enabling applications. So for example, if you are in a field where you have to enter information, that it will automatically fade in the keyboard. And it will also get, be aware of where you put in things, that um, it will not slip behind the keyboard, that it will shift at the upper um, part of the, of the display and will not cover, the, 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 the um, field will not be covered by the keyboard, for example. And it works currently with um, Senap 6.5, with, uh, with uh, Hotfix Roller 1, and even with the current VDAs based on Windows 7, for example. Um, MicroVPN is pretty new. <coughs> uh, only a few guys know something about it or are aware of it. 
that, for example, the Android devices are able to establish a micro VPN to the backend, but currently the backend component is not ready to manage the micro VPN. This can be done with an upcoming release of the app controller, um, where you can um, steer the micro VPN, which ports will be opened, which backend systems, which IP addresses can be reached by the mobile apps. Weapon SARS CAM apps, um, there are a lot of Weapon SARS apps, uh, customer portals, external host portals, for example, if you would like to rent a car, if you would like to make a hotel reservation, check in or book a flight. There are many portals, for example, here in Germany for Bo uh, Lufthansa, uh, Berlin, and so on, um, where we can um, use even this mobile uh, Weapon SARS apps with single sign on even if they are hosted externally, and even use provisioning. That's pretty cool, because then normally the user doesn't know his, his password. He, so he only knows his domain password, and by using SAML, the account for the weapon SAS apps is automatically created, and he just logs on with um, the user account and domain password. And if the user is locked in the domain, he will also um, be not able to access uh, the external portal, for example. Mobile apps is brand new, so there are currently only a few mobile apps, and even Citrix will provide a few mobile apps like uh, at work mail, at work web, go to meeting, go to uh, webinar, polio, and the yeah. last one, and share funding. Yeah. This mobile app which can be deployed by just using the app controller, and we just announced that we will establish a brand. MDX ready, and that um, um, creators of mobile apps can uh, can make their apps available to a Citrix app store. So it will be um, so these apps can be managed by just using the app controller. And data is a share file integration which currently works very well, and which will be improved in the upcoming release of the app controller. Where you can say that, for example, for a specific user, the um, storage will be hosted on premise, so it will be in your data center instead of also being hosted in the cloud, for example, at EC2. And we just announced that we will, or just two days ago, three days ago, we just launched our um, AU data center and even two data centers in Germany, where all the data is hosted when hosting it to the cloud. So, um, if you don't want to be, um, or you don't want to, to host your data in the US, in the Amazon EC2, you can just create your account and select the, the, the German or European data center in Amsterdam, for example, or in like Ireland. Not all tools are ready now to connect uh, to shareholder.eu, but they will be end of the year, maybe early next year. Um, then all the credential information will be stored in German data center or in the European data center and not going over to the US, have it, act all the things and <coughs> store your data on trans in your own data center. That's most important for most European customers. So no dependencies to overseas to have it, act to, to data centers in the US. And it's even faster because you don't have to, uh, to go all through the latency to the US. HTML5. Who has tested it? So it works very well. That so with why, why not? Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's it will not, it's not the same experience. So for a user, yeah. it's just a backup. If yeah. The rest right. is not working. That's just what it's intended for. Yes. It's like so the old Java client. But so the client, my clients will go. Oh, we'll use that. No, no, yeah. no. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, that's you, the you problem. You decide even from the security perspective if you want to have your browser access your local hard drive, for example, client write mapping and such stuff, uh, security related things. Maybe you don't want that. Yes, the HTML5 receiver is fine for doing some productive work, but you can't use all the things, media redirection, flash redirection, all that stuff is not working in HTML5 right now. But it's really a great thing for uh, bring your own device strategy, because nobody who's coming into a company for a short amount of time, maybe one month or two, uh, want to have things installed on their private laptop or their corporate laptop. So you can say, do you have an <coughs> HTML5 uh, compatible browser? Yes. And here you go. You can use it, mm -hmm. not with full functionality, but 
working good, even from a um, performance perspective, yeah. I have to say. So it's currently supported only with Chrome and Firefox browsers. It's not working with Internet Explorer because Internet Explorer is not fully HTML5 compatible. But um, it works very well and you have to use storefront services for it. So um, as a pre-requirement, you need definitely to have storefront services. And then you install on top of storefront service the HTML5 receiver, which is only a small MSI package. I think it's only two megabytes in size. And it's, it's just next, next, finish, and it works out of the box. We can even we can do a short demo on hopefully how well it works and just using an internet connection and using the HTML5 receiver. So I use my Chrome browser and I disable the plugin detection for the Citrix receiver. So it will ask me if I would like to install my um, receiver now. Just log on. And in the meantime, I can present my brand new Windows 8 tablet. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> so. so, for example, we can just launch a setup desktop. And as you can see, it will open up a new tab on it. And no matter if you would like to use a full desktop or even just an application, it will launch the app or even the desktop. It's presenting the connection dialog to the user. As you can see on the right side, we implemented some features, for example, clipboard mapping that you can use cut and paste and can even send third commands to the remote session instead of just using it to, to your local um, device. So that's a Xenop desktop running on HTML5. And maybe we can even use um, a cat application in HTML5 showing some rendering that it works pretty well. It really depends on the internet connection, so I think that there are some guys outside leeching. And yeah, the first hour yesterday was over two gigs. So. Okay. <laughs> so for sure anyone who didn't see the mobility pack yet, yeah. <laughs> this mobility pack where we have an overlay for Windows Explorer and uh, the start menu, for example, to be touch enabled, I can switch off the, uh, the mouse pointer and use touch uh, gestures, for example, and uh, can launch applications. And from here, for example, it's the Windows 8 desktop. Um, maybe you want to go to my computer and it looks different as my normal uh, uh, Windows Explorer because it's uh, touch optimized with bigger icons and so on. It's a nice thing. If you have to use um, your natural desktop on a touch enabled device with a small form factor. So, um, this HTML5 receiver it's, works out of the box if you are using uh, Chrome or even Firefox and you have to do nothing. If you would like to have the full functionality, you have to reinstall the receiver. So, Jeff. Uh, there was one thing what I, uh, I, I'm not sure if it's done by the mobility pack, but if you have the uh, iPad tablet, yeah. then Siri works as well for dictation. I mean, the dictation works then as yeah, well. Yeah, you can I'm use not Siri. Sure if that's I done think through the mobility pack. No, 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 it's, it's, it's native iOS integration. Yeah. I think no. that there's also a block from, uh, I don't know, I can't remember the name. Actually, that works Chris. quite well. Yeah, it's like yeah. You can uh, dictate it and then he writes it in, in your Word yeah. or uh, Outlook yeah. or whatever. But it's still a it's speech to text and yeah. only converted by the local subsystem over the receiver. And yeah, it only works time. on certain keyboards. Mm -hmm. yeah. will, will there be an update soon for the mobility pack? Because I have a lot of problems with it. With, with Why? Hanging, hanging sessions. So hanging because, sessions. Because it doesn't log off, it, it disconnects, and then 99% CPU. Okay. I've never seen this before. On iPhones. I, I know we Not on iPads, some. just on iPhones. That sounds more like a Microsoft. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know we had some issues with language. 
if you have a German servo, as for example, and you no, have a bit. <laughs> <laughs> for example, always in French. No, no, or always in English. Yeah, other language, language than English. English pack. And yeah. uh, you switch on a mobility pack, then the overlay is in English, but your native OS is in another mm -hmm. language. This was one bug. Another was um, policy is not enforced. So you could access Drive C or something. Yeah, wrong, but this wrong has way been, to but this has been yes. fixed. Yeah, so that was in January. Yeah. February. So okay. using an iOS device, it's disconnecting when, when logging it's off. It's always disconnected, so yeah. it, 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 it takes up more resources. So, yeah. you but you can set it by just using a policy yeah. that you would like to, to log off a disconnected session after a certain amount but of time. But for PCs, you don't want to think it. Yes. <laughs> we'll see if there are enhancements made to this. If there will be. Right now, it's by design, unfortunately. Uh, but you have a lightning fast. We connect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, have to, that's a positive way. <laughs> you have to present it in a positive way to the customers. Oh, I know. We're going to do us. Well, it should be working. So, and even with an extra lead with a space control. Yeah, because I have a client that, yeah. that, that uses a um, single account for more more users. Yeah. So then it doesn't work. So, yeah. the reconnect doesn't work. switch it off workspace control. Definitely. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, couldn't be tough for him, is it? Cloud Cake Wave Press, what is it? A modern, modern replacement for legacy web interface. So it's definitely the way to go. And what you should definitely not do uninstall web interface and reinstall um, Storefront Express or Storefront Services. So in the current releases, or it really depends on, on the client you're using, because um, not every client is aware of using software services. We got a lot of some clients' windows, which are currently not compatible. For example, Eagle, Wise, HP, HP, okay, haven't had an HP. So they are all aware of it, and um, we are in contact with the same client vendors, and they have to provide a new client on their device. To, to get it work. So um, if you're 100% sure that there are no thin clients, you can switch to Storefront services. If there might be some thin clients in, 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 the, in the environment, you should stay on web interface and then decide on the session policies and session profiles on Access Gateway, which backend service you would like to provide, switching to web interface or even to Storefront services for the modern receivers. So we'll see this later based on <coughs> maybe user agent header you can redirect your, your endpoint device to a certain profile, web interface, legacy site, or whatever you want to use. Storefront services even provide self-service upgrade to receivers. That means that we can implement an upgrade service just by using merchandising server. It's still available. It works. And we try even to connect directly to, to Citrix.com. So you can cho choose if you don't want to use upgrade services if I would like to use a merchandising server or if I would like Citrix.com as a source for my updates for the certain plugins for the receivers. Follow me Windows apps and desktops. Um, that's a functionality that we store the information about the favorites the users are using in a database. The only support database currently is SQL. So we have to use Microsoft SQL um, 2008 and even 2012 um, for storing the information and it, it's only taking a small amount of of, of, um, of this space on, on, on the SQL database. It's about 10k per user pair. And in the new one it's better? In the new one it's getting better and we try to avoid SQL. the database. Yes. So <laughs> it's getting better and better. So it's it's still a version one under the hood. So it's will, will, it, will it be Q1 in January or Q1? I March? think that we will see uh, a release this year. Okay. So better. if you one three for if, a if you download uh, the Excalibur beta, yeah, which it's in there. Yeah, it's, it's, it's already one or one or three. Yes, I didn't test it yet because it's two days ago. Um, but there are some enhancements already. Yeah, and that's for the no SQL anymore. Um, yeah. And they're working hard on it um, because we have a, a secret access to, to the developer share. 
and we can see that there will be about three or four releases a day. Yeah. Very good. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's, it's a really a nightmare to keep up with that. Yeah. <laughs> Easy install in minutes, that's definitely true. Uh, because the installer checks all the pre-requirements, if the IS is enabled, if the .NET isn't there. And if not, it will automatically install the roles or even the features on the Windows machine and then install software services. So it's pretty straightforward, it's taking only a few minutes. Um, depending on um, the internet connection or because we are using um, signed applets. So if you're behind a proxy with authentication, it, it can take ages because it waits for the timeout, kicks in the next time, waiting for the timeout. So make sure that you have internet connection or disable the certificate revocation list checking on this Windows machine to speed up the install sequence. No new hardware required because it just runs on a Windows Service System, only on 2008 R2 Service Pack 1. That's the officially supported platform. Um, SQL database 2008 to uh, 2012. But um, you can even install the database on a SQL box 2005, for example, because in our lab we got an old SQL box and we even used this old SQL 2005 to host the data store for our store and services. Easy upgrade to Cloud Gateway Enterprise, yes, because it's only a content controller behind it. So you just import the virtual appliance, configure it, and then instead of just specifying the XML services for XenApp and Xen Desktop, you just specify um, the HTTPS port for the app controller, and that's it. And then storefront services will aggregate all the resources, if it's XenApp, Xen Desktop, web SaaS, data, and even the Google Apps, and present all the views to, 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 the, to the users, where they can choose from their apps um, and just put in the favorites. We received a lot of questions regarding um, resiliency for the SQL box. So it, it really depends what you would like to achieve because um, the enumeration of all the apps is in real time and the SQL box will not be involved. So the SQL box will only be involved for just presenting the favorites. So if the, the SQL is down, you use just your favorites. But all your apps in there are there. You can uh, search for your apps. You can choose the apps. You can launch the apps. Because they do not rely on the SQL boxes just for, for storing the information. Ronald has Microsoft Word as favorite enough to present it on the top of, of the store so or the receiver format, for example. Your favorite is currently read from the database or written from the database, <coughs> so it's temporary. You can temporarily uh, configure your favorites. Okay. So compared with web interface, there's n there are no changes on the configuration of server phones or content controllers. Just by specifying um, the XML port by just using port 80 HTTP, HTTPS, or SSL relay if you would like to use it. And um, the cool thing is that storefront can be configured in a server group. It's like a cluster. And they are all sharing the same information because they rely on the information of the SQL box in the backend. So you can, uh, there, there's no data collector role. So they are all on the same level. It's like Xen Desktop with controllers because they just read the information and store the information in the SQL box. And everyone in the cluster or in the server group is aware of it and can use this information. Please be careful with credential wallet service. Maybe it is terminated sometimes unexpectedly. So if you can't log in through your Cloud Gateway Express installation to Storefront, check if credential wallet service is running on all your uh, members of the server group. Um, one thing regarding sizing. How many boxes do I need for Storefront services? Um, internally, we have done some testing um, and with a normal box with two virtual CPUs, we can handle about 30,000 lock-ons per hour. So it should fit a normal <laughs> <laughs> installation. And for resiliency reasons, I would every time I would like to go with at least two boxes, for example, and that should fit for a normal infrastructure. Maybe you can bring it down with uh, load testing, but not in a normal circumstances. So, um, here's the big picture, internally and externally. Um, you just specify by using your mail account, for example, or the backend service site, 
um, the Storfin services, and it will connect by just using X gateway or directly to the Storfin services if the device is on the internal network. Scale out, yes. Um, I think that there's also a white paper available of just using NLB, Microsoft NLB for um, using Storfin service because you have to use a load balancer when using um, a server group consisting of at least two, divide, uh, two, two, two servers. In most cases, it's better to use the NetScaler if you have to buy a gateway. In this case, uh, Gateway Enterprise, for example, it's better to purchase a NetScaler box and use the load balancing feature of this one if your uh, customer has the money to achieve or can go for the NetScaler instead of the Xscaler Enterprise only. Um, the different receivers look very similar. On the right hand side you can see the um, beta receiver of Windows 8, which can be installed by just using the store, the Microsoft App Store. Uh, if you would like to test it, you have to switch to English language, I think, because it's, it's only on the English App Store. Um, and then you can use it. If you would like to use it, the Windows 8 beta receiver of um, which is also um, available on Windows RT, you have to use Storefront Services, a store website. Not the native store, it's using a store web. So you have to make a session policy for it on the Netscaler device and pointing the, based on the user agent string, um, you have to point it to the store web, which normally the users are like only using when using a browser. Okay, switching to our app. <laughs> so it's a little bit slow. So what we got here is a domain controller. We got Excel machine providing all the apps in the desktops as a content controller. We got our Netscaler box here. We got a firewall for just simulating the internal and external access. And we got two Windows machines up and running um, just installed as plain member service um, for hosting storefront services for resiliency reasons to nodes. What we already did here for getting fast up and running is that we installed the different roles. What you can do is just um, use PowerShell to install it automatically, provide it to the customer or to the client, and you're ready to go with just installing Storefront on it. Most of the time, if you're installing this, you're waiting for the pad if you don't do it before. So that's the reason we're doing it before, but because just sit and waiting for .NET to be installed, it's boring. So, this is your storefront. This is a full installer. If you download it from the Masterfix portal, and you can see that it's about 100 mm -hmm. megabytes in size. Um, why is it so big? The storefront is only a few megabytes. The size consists of the fact that we include um, into the installer the receiver for Windows and the receiver for Mac. And that's taking most of the space in this package. So if it's extracting it, it's about 8 Macs in size uh, only for storefront. The rest is for the receiver for Windows and even the receiver for Mac. So the installation is pretty straightforward. Just double click on it, run. And it will check the pre-requirements if the IS is in, uh, in already installed, all the different components uh, it needs. So, um, CGP automatic reconnect. Um, so it's 
simple platform. We never had an internet working. <laughs> working. <laughs> it's two uh, three G three G connections and one from the hotel yeah. combined, and still it's uh, I don't know like fifty people at once connecting and updating their yeah. podcasts. And <laughs> So these are the different roles and components it's installing. Uh, the storefront framework, the storefront stores add-in, and the Citrix receipt for web add-in. As you can see, it's not very complicated. So it's taking only one or two minutes, depending on the hardware you've got, and then it will finish. And the good thing is that as uh, that we that we split the setup of storefront service into an installation part and into a configuration part. So you can, for example, install it, leave it, clone it, copy it, for example, this machine, and then configure it. All, um, all of the configuration can be done by just using the GUI, because uh, the console is launching after the installation, and you can even configure it by just using Porsche. Can automate the deployment from end. So after the installation, the console pops up and is asking me how I would like to deploy storefront. And when trying to deploy storefront, um, you have three options depending on the configuration you would like to use. And as you can see in this case, uh, it's not so good on the beamer. Um, the first point deploy a single server is grayed out. And I would recommend that you never try to deploy a single server because a single server deployment cannot be changed into a multiple server deployment or when just deploying a single server you cannot change any additional server to the server group. So even if you would like to, to deploy only a single box, please go for the multiple server deployment. Because then you can even use um, the database on another server. The single uh, server deployment requires the SQL box or the SQL server and to be deployed on the same machine. So same, same concept as in Quick Deploy for Clandestine, for example, if you have, where you have to install all the components on one single box. So what we would like to do is to do a, a multiple server deployment. And this one is the first node. Even if you start with a multi-server deployment, you can use a single node for this one. So, but you can go bigger. So this is the most important part because it's asking you for the host name. It's a host name, it's a virtual name, uh, especially in, in, in a load balanced environment. So you have to specify <coughs> um, the virtual name of your load balanced V server, for example. In our case, it's cgx.training.local. And you even should take care about um, the protocol. In our case, it's HTTPS. And you should use HTTPS because all the authentication is done by just using Storefront. Storefront is talking directly to the domain controllers, and that's different to the way it is done with web interface. Because with web interface, the authentication is done using the XML services on Xenab and even on Xenester. So if you don't change it here, you have to do it with PowerShell. There is no GUI option to change this. So double check it. Um, if you misspell it, you only have to use, you only can uninstall it, reinstall it, or use PowerShell, uh, PowerShell to change the host name. The database is already set up on our domain controller. It's called Citrix Store. Front, <laughs> and it even gives you the possibility to test the connection successfully. Create. And what it's doing now is it's not creating the database. It's not like um, Xenap, if the, the, the Xenap server joins the server farm, it, it, it creates all the entries in the database and all the tables. It's creating the configuration, but it's nothing written into the database. The database is, or will be still 
be clean and pristine even after 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 joining um, the store. Most people know how this is done uh, with provisioning services or it's a desktop <coughs> where you um, configure the database via the UI. But it's not possible uh, in multi-server deployment for software services. But on the other side, there's a good security perspective from it that you can take out from Edox, for example, the uh, scripts for um, configuring the database, give it to your SQL guys, say, hey, look at the scripts, then you know what we are doing, and not a bad installer doing things to your database server, for example. Maybe it's a security feature you can uh, promote to, to your SQL or to your database table. So, after joining the store, um, you have to specify the store name, in our case it's just store. Um, enter the delivery controllers. In our farm, it's Zenep. Specify the XML server. We'll be using port 80, HTTP. And that's it. After this, it's asking you if you would like to make the store available remotely. So, would you like to provide remote access? No. No VPN tunnels, this is ICA proxy only. And full VPN tunnels, this means that the store can be accessed by using SSL VPN plugin or ISO um, ICA proxy. So, it includes all the previous options. Specify a name for the access gateway. Gateway URL. This is um, the URL of the B server for Access Gateway. And then we can decide if the Access Gateway is the appliance or an Access Controller. And if you are using Access Gateway Enterprise Edition. In our case, we will use Access Gateway Enterprise Edition. And for signaling, if the authentication is done by just using the authentication service on the access gateway or the authentication has to be done by storefront services, um, it's, it's trying to figure it out by just using the subnet address. If the request comes from the subnet IP address of the access gateway, then it is using the callback URL for the authentication on the access gateway and otherwise it will use the internal authentication on storefront services. So here you can say um, how I would like to authenticate. It's domain only by just using username and password, security token only by just using radius, um, domain and OTP or just using SMS authentication which means, um, which means uh, challenge, challenge response. In our case, we are just using domain authentication. If you're selecting SMS, what is it using as a service? Is it an internal service? Or no, it's it just using radius because all the okay. authentication sure, is done response. because it's, it's, it's under the configuration of the access gateway. Sure. Yeah. So that means it's, it's using the configuration of the, the, the Netscape or even access gateway appliance. Sure. And the callback URL. Um, Then it's providing the information for the internal service on uh, the access gateway. Secure ticket authority, HTTP. Create, and we are nearly done. So it's the only thing it will ask you later on is information for the beacon services. So using the beacons, it's trying to detect if it's connecting or if you are connecting internally or externally, and that's it. So the configuration is pretty straightforward. If you're familiar, for example, with web interface, you know your XML services, you know the FQDN of your virtual load balancer, and even the FQDN of the access gateway or even ICA proxy. 
after this, um, it's providing the information and you can even click on it by just testing your storefront if it's going up with green bubble seam and you can provide the, the lock-on credentials to log on to your store. You should have your local and up and running. So after the initial con uh, configuration, the console pops up, and um, I can configure everything afterwards. And that's something you should do before going on, because when going to the different points, you can see that currently there is a server group with only one member, because we just installed the first server in the server group, there is only one, which can be contacted by our local and so virtual server name. The authentication configured is by just providing username and password and pass through from Access Gateway. And what you should do, definitely, because there is currently an issue or a bug in there, that you can configure or should configure um, also pass through, for example, for internal clients. If you configure it afterwards, it may break the configuration, so it's that you have to recreate the whole start. So it's currently addressed, and I think that it will be fixed in an upcoming release, or there's maybe already a private available for it. So authentication, just click in or enable all methods. I can even uh, manage password options to allow users to change expired passwords. There's a stock configuration, and afterwards I can even specify multiple servers, for example, providing the information just using the XML service. Remote access is enabled. Uh, manage receiver updates. The so default setting is by getting updates from Citrix.com. In our case, we are not using the merchandising server, you can even disable it. And um, depending on um, what edition of Access Gateway you're using, this is very important because um, this kind of information will configure the plugins for the receiver. For example, if you're using App Controller for providing um, data, and the user don't have to uh, configure, for example, the ShareFile plugin. So it will be automatically configured by just using the receiver, using the information provided by store. And even the share file for output plan. So the user just using, uh, uses a single logon, and all the plugins will be configured by using the information provided by store from services. <coughs> Um, in this case, I can even provide the provisioning file, sending it to the users, link it to the users, and the store will be auto-created. Um, are you aware of an issue with it? Um, the extension we are using is uh, .cr for Citrix receiver. So it's working with nearly every receiver. The only receiver who cannot use it is the extension is the receiver for Android. You have to rewrite it by just using um, expressions on Netscaler, or has have to, to rename it to the extension XML, so that the Android receiver can import the config file. Um, I can even change the database afterwards, and I can even can made, uh, modify the, the legacy support. And as you can see, we are still supporting the config XML file. But the config XML file isn't there because it's rendered in, in real time for the devices which are currently using legacy mode. Uh, receiver for web. It's pointing to a store. That's it's nothing else. That's a pretty cool thing. It's now pointing to a store. Not like in web interface where you have uh, your web interface and your web interface service side with different configurations. Now you have dependencies, yes, but if you configure it on one, uh, in one option, you automatically have provided this information to the uh, store web. So it's a really cool thing that you only have to, to provide only one configuration and all the other components like legacy, store web or whatever is just pointing to the central configuration. And then even getting a closer look to the configuration files, because the configuration is stored in files, just XML-based files, which I can edit with Notepad, for example. Um, 
how the configuration is done um, cumulative, cumulative done. Beacons. Um, we configure the internal FQDN for the load balancer as internal beacon just to try to detect if you're internally. And external is the FQDN of our access gateway plus service.com. I would change it. Yeah. I would change it to location next to the customer, next to your end user. Because it gets and get or it doesn't get to the URL. And if you have high latency because you use Citrix Japan or something, it goes over the ocean and back. And therefore I would go for uh, URLs which are entering really fast, high ZD in Germany for example, or, or some URLs near you. So you can really sniff it just by using Wireshark that the, the, the client device running the receiver is ready to try to get to the site you specified as beacon. So it's waiting and it's really providing or it's, it's trying to catch a get. And if the response is okay, it, it detects that it's hosted externally and if it tries to, to, to resolve it internally, then it also gets it. So make sure that you rely on fast points specified there. So, that's it. We are up and running with our first node, and in theory we can use it just for internal purposes or testing purposes, for example. Uh, what we will do now is just set up the second node. That's my RDP. I created a new uh, SSID. You could try it if it's faster, but I'm not sure. Because I, the three Gs, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's always a problem. <clears throat> same procedure for the installation and after the installation when the console pops up we will specify the third option that we join the, the multiple server deployment. On the other hand we have to go back to the first server node, go into the console, go into the server groups tab and we have to add a new server. What it will do then is that it will provide you the information which you have to enter on your second or on the following nodes, which is the authorizing server, and you will get an authorization code. So you can just use cut and paste. So it's like a one-time password for joining the other box. will be grayed out because there's no SQL on it. We will not would like to deploy a server group. The beaver grays out. Yeah. <laughs> we will join an existing C01. Just 
paste it, and that's it. What you should make sure is that there's no firewall between it. So on the first side, I would like to normally disable the client firewall or the Windows firewall that they will be able to, to join the server group and um, to exchange their keys. Because what is happening now is that the second node will create a self-signed certificate. It will push it to the first server node and that they will replicate the configuration using a secure connection by just using the certificate. They are not replicating the uh, configuration automatically. You have to push or to pull, but to be prepared if you want to do it. So they have to change certificates. And if you are on a different site, uh, geographical site, uh, you have a uh, firewall. So, <coughs> so, you so you expose the uh, you expose the machine to the same site, and after you move. Uh, that's 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 normally not a supported configuration. Yeah, but you can do it because all the configuration is stored just in plain text files, and that's it. So, going back to the server group, and as you can see, the second server successfully joins the server group, and it will warn you that the configuration is not in sync. So we got our node 1, which is already configured, and we got our empty node 2. <coughs> and the only thing, uh, and it's normally not rocket science, but you should read carefully if you would like to push, or you would like to pull the configuration your empty configuration <laughs> fully configured server. That's so, not a good idea. Just check it. Yes. We are node 2 and we don't want to propagate changes. We would like to sync changes which means pull changes from our first server node. Or change to server node 1 and then propagate the changes to the group. So like all you say, it's not rocket science, but you have to be concentrated. <laughs> we, have, we, we have some colleagues. Yeah, just click in on it and oh, the configuration is gone. <laughs> well. It does not break anything, but you have to reconfigure it. It takes time. Mm -hmm. Customer side, it's not always the best thing to show the customer that you are not familiar with that kind of things. So it's taking a while, but just replicating the configuration. And that means it's not only copying the files over, it's even just putting the PowerShell commands to the other node and then executing the PowerShell commands that they are in sync. It's a little bit slow in this environment because it's not server class hardware, it's just PC and it's just running on one spindle. Four year old PC with a single uh, SATA hard drive. It works. Yeah. Some kind of. So, after the synchronization process, if you switch back to the console, it can be, um, in this case, it will signal that the configuration was successful. And then switching back to the first node, yeah, it already reads it. So in, in case that it, it's still throwing a warning, just refresh it. That's it. And it will reread the whole configuration, and then it will give you the information that it's the sync, and both nodes are, are having the same configuration. So. Um, what about modification afterwards? Because I cannot do every modification, for example, just enabling workspace control uh, for providing updates for the receivers, for example, by just using the GUI. These points, which currently can be done by using the web interface console, are not currently implemented in the storefront service console. But it can be done into a text file. And even this is not rocket science when going to the text file. It's the same as in web interface. Yeah. Not all options from web interface, web interface conf uh, has been exposed to the GUI. So it's the same procedure here. Go to your web config and change it there. 
what will be the reason not to put it in the QE? Uh, time, time. Okay. And they don't want to have an overcrowded uh, GUI, for example. Yeah. But and we'll see. It's if, if the market demands it that it has to be in the GUI, <coughs> we will do it for sure. But it takes us some time to get there. Auto connect and lock on the set to true. Set it to false. Um, show disconnect button, for example. Work. Set it to true. Yeah. And even show reconnect yes. button. I think. Uh, yeah. Quotes. Yeah. Quotes. quotes. Try here the character, the double quotes. All true. Uh, false is not false. Set true. You change it to true. Then there. Okay. At true. True. It's more of a true. Yeah. That's why we need GUI. <laughs> Good point. Uh, uh, you can change the settings uh, using PowerShell? Well, not all settings. Not all settings. <laughs> By using search in the players. <laughs> okay. So, what about the configuration? Of our second node. Do I need to make the same changes on the second node? No. no. Because also, we replicate this um, changes and just propagating the changes. So that means that every change is replicated, even it's, if it's not done using the GUI or the console. The only um, thing which we are currently not replicating is if you would like to, or if you are customizing the GUI, um, there's a special uh, directory, and this directory will not be replicated by, by using this um, mechanism. Okay, look, up and running. So we have the sales configuration replicated across the nodes. The only thing we need now to do is just setting up um, the load balancer, the V server. And for this, I'm switching back to the domain controller. Scaler. And then the first thing we need to have is a certificate for it because we are using HTTPS. Just importing it. you shouldn't do that in a production environment. So you should separate the private key and the certificate and store it on separate locations. But it's a training environment, so we need to, to separate those. So we got the certificate with the private key. And what we are using is an SSL offload. What we put in there are both server nodes as server, representing the backend, cgx01 dot training dot IP address. Okay. Uh, using server node 2, IP 17. You can do SSL offload, but you have not to do it because of security perspective. If you want to talk to a backend uh, with HTTPS because of security reasons, you, you can use SSL as well to the, the backend system, but you can reduce the load on your web interface or on servers by offloading uh, the SSL handshake to the Netscape. So it depends on your security model. 
do you consider your internal traffic as secure? Yeah, offload it. If not, leave. So then we create a server group consisting of these both nodes and specify the port or service providing the service. It's normal IS, HTTP traffic in our case. It will automatically enable it because it's binding the default monitor, and the default monitor is just doing a sync and uh, just um, getting a sync egg, as you can see. So it only means it has connectivity to this backend system, but it's not checking if the IS is running, if the website is up and running, and so on. And we will specify it later on by just creating our own monitor for monitoring um, the storefront website. <coughs> then we will create our virtual server. Which is V server CG training dot local slash SSL. We specify a meaningful name like V server for example. If you want to parse your NSConf file or NetScaler config file, there you can uh, search or replace for for string v server and you know this is a string where v server gets created because there are the native commands or in the nsconf file how to create a virtual server is it a virtual server is it a, a load balancing server or whatever and you can parse your config file rip out some, some pieces and do a lot of automation with, with this kind of a meaningful name you know. so we need to specify a name the protocol an ip address and as we are using SSL, we have to specify the certificate with a private key, which I already did. Then I bound the service group, specifying the both backend resources with the protocol to, uh, to it. And the only other thing I need to specify is uh, the load balancing method and persistence. And I just use least connection, which is like using the basic load evil in, in, uh, in, in Senna and the persistence based on the source IP address, so that means different hosts are redirected to different backend systems. Um, and that's it. Yeah, I already created it. And now, we should be able, by specifying HTTPS, cgx.training.local, store web, or virtual load balance server, and it will be and it will redirect us to the backend uh, corresponding backend resources, back to CG or one or even or two. This can take some time because it's compiling .NET features in the background, and after this is done, we get the page displayed. Okay, so it's not in the trusted sites, and I even have not installed my receiver on the domain controller, and now it should be popping up with um, the lock-on dialog. You can just use, oops, you can complete. Normally means that the prediction wallet service is not running. <laughs> so it's blind. Be careful with, the, with this, this one service. Um, uh, look for it. We start it regularly. Yeah. Right now it's not. So wait for 1.3. Yeah. In most cases, it's only a timing issue. It's, it's depending on the speed of the machine, the spinners, and so on. And normally, in a, in a production environment, it should not happen. So it's running on the first node. Okay. In a load balance environment, you always have to check all nodes. You don't know where you get you get redirected to. No, it's, 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 it's just running config, but yeah, I can say right. to check. Uh, I think that I misspelled something. Or we have to check if persistency has been stored in the config of the V server. So 
So the service group, if they are supposed to be off and running. Source IP. Suppose. One single IP. Such a picture is okay. Let us give it a try from another machine. Check it during the break, and then we should be up and running with it. Um, <coughs> okay, here we are. I think that I haven't configured a submit IP address for the Internet Scaler. Um, so, as you have seen, it's quite simple to set up storefront services, just for providing access to the setup and the desktop. And even the configuration of the load balancing is quite easy. The only thing we can do now, um, from the Dead Scaler perspective, to provide our own monitor, is just create a simple monitor for checking if, for example, the store website is up and running. And this can be done quite easily by just creating a new monitor. I'm just using HTTP. And the default is just checking the root, which is uh, the default IIS website. In our case, we should change it to Citrix store. Web slash. And we will request um, or the, 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 the server will be signal up and running if we will get the response code 200, which, which means OK, that he successfully gets to the content. So where's the monitor? There it is. And the only thing we need to do is go to back to the service group. And just bind it to it. Hopefully, you can see that both nodes are up and running. And you can even see the data it's, it's getting. So here, you can see that it's trying to head to store web. And it successfully can connect to it, getting the response code, which are a normal or which is a normal web error code. And even check it for the second node. Do not get in panic if this shows you for a minute uh, down, because maybe it's compiling your .NET in the background when you rebooted your uh, storefront service or you have not, or have not compiled on that already. So, any questions regarding the first part, configuring Cloud Gateway Express storefront services? No? No questions? So, I would like to propose to make a short break, 10 up to 15 minutes, getting some coffee. Uh, we finally figured it out and got it working. It means I just log on and um, it enumerates all the different apps from my Excel machine. Okay. And as you can see, we got two different tabs, like web interface for the desktops and even for the apps. And that's uh, something you can also customize by just editing the web.config file. Um, if your preference is to, to have um, the applications, 
on, on, on the first view and behind the desktops you can just change it and you can even integrate um, the desktops as a normal app into the application so that mm -hmm. they, the, the, the user does not have the choices to switch between apps and desktops so they get only one view and it, this view is only containing the, the apps and even the desktops. There's a publishing keyword, treat as app, and then it's displayed in the, in the app tab. And then the, you have the same look and feel like on your uh, receiver for Android where all is on the same pane. So when you don't have the, uh, it's not divided into two uh, panes like desktops and apps. Mm -hmm. Okie doke. Um, Customization can be done quite easily. There's a good blog article from a Dutch guy who already did some customizations, and it's, it's much more easier than customizing the interface. And what we do is that we also guarantee that customization is not broken or overwritten, but just upgrading to another edition of uh, a version of, of spoken services. Um, customization. Just modify the styles sheet in the store web. There's a folder called contract. Nope. There you can just modify all, everything by editing the style sheet. And that's not overwritten and that's keep, kept between upgrades. So um, that your customization will survive an update. So, switching back to PowerPoint, and let's begin with Cloud Gateway Enterprise. Cloud Gateway Enterprise is brand new, and um, as already said, it's a, a Linux based appliance hosted on a hypervisor um, where I can provide access to web assets mobile apps, and even to data, which means share file. Um, for the appliance, you currently need at least one gig of RAM. Um, two or one? I think that's one, one CPU. One. And that's it. For production purposes, you should configure the special appliance with, with uh, at least four gigs of RAM. So it's default comes down, if you download it, it's pre-configured the, the XVA file uh, with uh, 4 gigs of RAM. So for your home environment, you can... Testing purposes, just configure it down to 1 gig and it works. But for production environment, you should at least left it to 4 gig of RAM. The, the reason behind it is that we... Um, in, in the background, there's a, a database running. And the database is storing all the information uh, regarding the user accounts, first lane, last lane, uh, email address, manager, and so on for the different workflows. And depending of, on, on the size of your active directory, it can contain thousands, tens of thousands of different accounts. So it takes a little while for enumerating data, and the more memory the virtual appliance does, the faster it will be. So, how is it configured to store from services? It's quite simple. It's just another content controller. It's done in the same way as we specified XMAP and desktop with XML services. Just point to the IP address or to the full qualified domain name of the app controller and you are ready to go. Um, resiliency is built in into the product. This means you can pair two or more appliances to a cluster and you can then point to um, the virtual, uh, virtual FQDN of this cluster and the cluster is, is running in HA. This means only one node is active and the other node is passive in case of failure or uh, the Pitbull service fails, it will fire up the other appliance with the services and switch over to the, to the second node. So this is the thing we see 90% or 90 plus person of the environments configured to add the app controller as a content controller for storefront services. If you do not have customers using Xenapp, Xen Desktop storefront service, only want to have uh, uh, web, SaaS, and mobile apps, then you can use uh, app controller standalone and pointing directly to the uh, app controller or on the app controller is running a store web, but you can use it for this purpose only. 
So currently we are supporting several and um, form-based authentication for web and SaaS apps. And we already have about 50, 60 um, pre-configured applications um, where you don't have to do anything regarding the configuration. We have to put in the username, the password, is there somewhere a submit button or a press OK button in the website. And if you have um, specific applications which, which you cannot get to run with App Controller, just open a support case and we have guys sitting in India which are currently very responsive. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah it's my family. <laughs> it's family business. You don't have to call them, you can just call them. You can just call them Jack. <laughs> now most of the development is currently done in, price form. <laughs> in India and they, they are very, very responsive. We have just had a case for a customer um, providing information for Lufthansa and it, it was only a 15 minutes job. And we had the first code snippet for testing and after two days they closed the case because the customer was satisfied by, by just using the Lufthansa portal for checking in, booking with company conditions and everything. You don't tell them that the translation costs one day. <laughs> <laughs> it's all in English. <laughs> so currently what we see is that we have an increase of web single sign-on solutions uh, using OpenID, using Xenon and even federation services. Especially the, the big, huge customers are using it for single sign-on to intranet and even uh, internet applications. So there's stated two, three years uh, from now. So tomorrow, I, I personally think we are going to to send on the my deal pretty fast. Right now, more and more um, providers of web SaaS application support SAML. With SAML 2.0, uh, there are a lot of more. Or there are more and more um, features like. Um, not only using SAML, security search markup language, so token-based uh, access or <coughs> security to, to Windows, uh, to web applications, but also to Windows applications. So this is supported by Microsoft with Server uh, 2012, built in with federation services and Active Directory components. So we'll see it more and more. Even OpenID is, is gaining more and more traction out, out there. Good. Some examples, SharePoint, uh, Terramark, Taleo, and um, here's a complete story, You're just using the SSL VPN or micro VPN, or secure browser on iOS, to get access to uh, internet applications. That's pretty cool. We try to fulfill this customer requirement as a part by using a reverse proxy like um, Nfuse Elite, MSM, maybe you know it. <laughs> and, uh, some really pain in the ass to get it working, especially if you've got Java applets running and, and have to rewrite it or not to rewrite something. And the good thing is um, that's all done by the client component, which means the receiver and it works out as a box. So there's no rewriting taking place on the Netscale or Exascape layer plans for rewriting, so it works with, with, with every application. The Cloud Gateway way, and that's the recommended way, that you currently mostly got a web interface in place for providing remote access to applications for your users, and just establish storefront services parallel to web interface for providing access for the new world for the customers or even the users with, with new receivers, with new devices and providing or keeping web interface especially for the PNH and Dark Center Services side if the customer is using SIM client devices or PN Lite based devices. That's the current most seen issue in the field um, when using software services that some SIM clients are not working, some SIM clients are working dependent on um, the, 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 the platform they are running on, if they are browser based, if they are uh, PLI based. So don't move away from web interface in the current stage. Keep it parallel to your storefront implementation and decide on the user agent header stream, which client you are running on, and then I'll point you to the web interface, to the legacy or a PN agent site or for providing store access, all the cool new features with follow me apps, follow me data, 
mobile uh, application management, um, mobile iOS application <coughs> management, um, just points them to the storefront server. Profile, you will see it live. Some demos. Here are some. Oops, it's not good rainbow, but they are there. It's like missing one color or something. Yeah. <laughs> A little bit better, but there's a false column as well. And you can see that there are some um, applications already um, existing as a template in the app controller, and they are getting more and more from day to day. So, in the false column are the most important send apps and desktop gem or software. <laughs> so, you can imagine there are a lot more. So, how does it work? It is. Um, Really simple if you see it live, and we will show it later on. That you just connect the app controller to your Active Directory, for example. Your Meta Directory hosting all the, the user information, first name, last name, email address, um, UPN for logging on, and even the, the infrastructure um, who is the, the manager, um, the first grade manager, second grade manager, because we rely on this information when using workflows. You can also implement workflows, for example, if your user would like to have an application, you request the application, he gets the application immediately in the store web or on his receiver pane, but um, the application icon is grayed out. And if you hover over it or mouse over it, it will say a uh, pending request, I think, if I remember right. And then it will fire up an email to the manager from your ID or to a certain email account, you can specify separately in the workflow, and the manager or multiple manager must approve the request. Because, for example, um, the cost center will be charged with, for the application cost and so on. And after um, the manager approves the request, um, the, the application will fade in, and the user can access the application. It will take some time because it's a scheduled process in the background. That means every 15 minutes we will ch check if there is a request, send the request to the manager, and after 15 minutes, for example, he will answer back, and it's sometimes a process of half an hour. That is fixed and currently cannot be steered, but I think it's okay when um, for approval pro process and that it can be, uh, or that the application can be assigned to a user in 30 minutes. It can be a problem in demos, but in normal uh, user environments, it's not a problem to wait a maximum half an hour if your manager is fast enough to click. Yeah. Um, the only downside when relying to the Active Directory is um, that you have to make sure that all fields are properly filled because we rely on this information. And we had some cases, for example, in, in, in demo implementations or even proof of concepts, that even if the user is in the assigned group and the group is in the assigned role for a certain application, the user cannot access the application. Why? Because, for example, the email field is not filled. Or the first name is missing, the last name is missing. So make sure that your ID contains all the necessary fields uh, providing the proper information, which can then be used by the app controller for the workflows and for for the assignment process. And this is written down as a known issue in the ops. And there's currently no no error message popping up, for example, uh, no checking mechanism. We are just importing the complete AD infrastructure for the corresponding fields, and that's it. And there's no filter, for example, saying that there are, it's missing. Um, the first name, the last name for a specific user. It's very irritating because there's a group or role called role users, and you see all applications uh, from this role which you attach to, to this role, but you don't see applications attached to your role depending on your ID uh, structure or ID group. And please make sure you use the right things. The cool thing 
with using SAML for <coughs> web-based application is that we can use account provisioning and even account deprovisioning. That means um, if the user is already creating a new ID infrastructure and you assign the user to a specific room, for example, for an application share file, you don't have to create the users um, on share file. It will be automatically created on share file using SAML and even when using the deprovisioning feature, you can just decide when deprovisioning a user, would I like to keep the data be created or put on share file? And should this data be assigned to the manager that he can then reassign it to uh, co-workers, for example, or should all the, all, all the information be deleted from share file? So it's, it's automatically, and you can even track who's using it, how many licenses I got, how many licenses uh, have been used previously, have I free licenses, or have I to reorder additional licenses, for example, uh, for assigning additional users to the application. I think some based authentication is the future, but you have to check with your service provider, where there are, all, there are always two sites, the identity provider, in most cases your own ID, uh, Active Directory, and the service provider, and you have to check if the service provider supports some authentication. And the account will first be created, the manager accept the request? Yes, okay. there's a workflow. Yes. So here are some provisioning connectors, um, and it's getting even more and more. And um, the only thing you have to make sure is that it's working. That uh, the, the provider can provide or will provide you with the several services, because sometimes um, Samuel is supported, but is supported with additional costs. So we, we got it, for example, at Salesforce, that's our CRM system. And um, yes, Samuel is there, but you have to have a certain account in a certain level with additional costs that you can use Samuel. Sometimes it's made on calls, calls to the Samuel engine, the Samuel API. And uh, for the authentication, I think you need three API calls. And if you have 10,000 API calls free a month, and you are back, you have to pay additionally. And it's new money. Yeah. It's an additional feature, and it normally costs, depending on the service provider you're using. Um, Summit is quite easy, or can be quite easy. But the bad news is that the uh, <coughs> I, I got when, when authenticating in my ID infrastructure, then exchanging the token with the token provider and then logging on to the, to, to the standard service, the token relies on a timestamp. So make sure that your time is in sync. <coughs> we just had the case that the customer cannot log on because um, the time service was misconfigured and the complete domain was out in sync and the token contains a valid from and a valid to field, and if it's not in the in the, in the time shift, it will fail with the authentication process. So make sure that the infrastructure, especially your ID infrastructure, is in sync with the internet time, for example. And is it like Kerberos with five minutes yeah. or maybe yeah. five, five, five minutes? I don't know, but it's a time frame. But it's the same procedure. If you don't have an NTP server running in the vein, or desktop. For uh, example, for and desktop, you have the same problems. You are not able to log on. Your uh, computer account passwords uh, cannot be checked, and such stuff is the same thing as with him. And that's one of the biggest issues we currently you are still are seeing in customer environments. Um, if you just look on to the computer, look on to the phone system, and that's a, a time drift of two or three minutes. Um, and you're getting into trouble when just implementing the desktop relying on Kerberos or even um, similar based applications where the token relies on a, a valid from up to two field. The problem is if you implement it, it works. Half a year later, it does not work anymore because the time still grow more and more. And then you have um, problems, especially if you're using hypervisor. You don't use hypervisor. <coughs> the time is there, you're in trouble somewhere in time. So here you can see the process taking place when using the workflow. It's quite simple, it's pretty straightforward, just specifying one or multiple approvers based on your ID infrastructure, or you can even specify separate email accounts. For example, if you got an external approver, 
or if the approver is not a member of your ID infrastructure. So it's working even with cloud. Do you rely on the manager attribute there? Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's based on all the information stored in the ID, which you can even use or when, 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 when looking at the hierarchy in exchange, for example, who's a manager and who has a team members and all this stuff. So we are using the same information stored in, in the ID, and that's a single point of contact, and, and all the information is in there normally. Um, the good news is it's, it's stupid, plain error. So um, it's no matter if it's um, Active Directory, or if it's OpenMetal up, or whatever else. Uh, so it's just pulling the, the attributes out of um, the infrastructure, and that's it. And under the hood, there's even a dictionary where you can assign specific attributes to username, is it first name, is it last name, or whatever else. So it's a very modularized uh, approach to assign the proper attributes to, to the fields we need. So I even tell you this with my, with my private GMX account, you can send it from there to, to anything for your own testing. You don't need a whole exchange infrastructure. Okay, the web and service apps we will show later on, and even the workflow management, which is pretty simple to set it up. Um, the coolest things customers are currently requesting from Citrix is the mobile application management. How to work with mobile, native mobile applications on my mobile devices. Can I also provide these mobile in, uh, applications to my customers? How can I make sure? that um, the, the users are not exposing any secure information or confidential information or sharing this confidential information <coughs> by using their own device and how can I make sure that even the data maybe that the application is, is, is um, creating or using is not exposed on uh, by your own device for example. That's also just a content controller based on the app controller where we wrap the mobile apps by using just a, a wrapper which is Java based. Currently running only on, on Mac OS because there are some limitations especially for the iOS devices that the application has to be wrapped on a Mac OS device and um, we are working on it that the wrapper will be also available on Windows platform but there are some uh, pitfalls, which we try to work around, and even the Android wrapper, just for wrap Android apps, is currently only available on Mac OS. Yeah. Recording <laughs> <laughs> the end. Um, that's the marketing stuff. We can just skip it, and this the interesting stuff with the three different layers. What we are trying to achieve with the next release. This is currently not implemented in the, the current 2.0 release. This will be released with 2.5, which is a Q4 release, which we will see this year. So we got the policy engine, which sits on the app controller, in combination with the Citrix receiver, which is enforcing all the policies set to a certain application. We got a mobile device management, sometimes, if we are using corporate owned devices. And that's the most interesting part because we are also looking into this um, space to sign an OEM agreement or to buy something that we could also provide, for example, mobile device management. To have a complete solution and not focusing only on, on the, so the, the mobile application management part. This is what we have right now, mobile application management. What I said earlier, it's really good for bringing your own device strategy that you don't have to control the whole device of the user, but you can control the applications belonging to the company, belonging to your corporate. And we will even provide some mobile applications like uh, already, already presented at Synergy in Barcelona with Secure Mail, Secure Browse, Collaboration, which is GoToMeeting, Podio, and also, um, which are native iOS apps, apps uh, iOS apps provided by Citrix um, using the same technology in the container format. Um, I think this 
Zeigen wir gleich, oder? Yeah, we'll show it. We'll show it. But this is a the story we are uh, doing right now from the receiver perspective. We have data containers or application containers on your on the endpoint, uh, accessing uh, your app controller or your central infrastructure over the, the VPN or micro VPN. <coughs> it's a per application VPN. You can call it so. And um, <coughs> Citrix receiver and Cloud Gateway, the app controller, are talking to each other, uh, exchanging information about what device status we have, is it rooted, is it uh, jailbroken, um, <coughs> am I in a certain um, wireless LAN, have, do I have access to the special SSID of the of wireless, for example, and then, depending on that, yeah, given parameters, we decide if you are able to launch the application or is it prohibited. Within the application, we can define uh, is copy and paste allowed or is it not allowed, for example. If I want to provide sensitive information to my, to my end user, I don't want to have copy and paste enabled to copy it in your Facebook or Twitter account or something. Then I say, okay, you use the corporate browser with special policies. If you are using uh, the, the wireless LAN, uh, you can use the application, but don't have copy and paste available, for example. It's just one, one example. There are a lot more. Or if you start this application, you can't turn on your camera on your device, for example, or, or such stuff. So we do mobile application management. We can divide your private life and the corporate apps. Yeah. Corporate apps can talk to each other. Private apps can talk to each other, but not um, cross. So, Let's switch to the lab environment to do the live stuff. And let's start with the configuration of the app controller. Waiting for boss. Okay, I already imported the virtual appliance. Just 300 max, yeah. 350 the, max. The OVA is a bit bigger for, for uh, there's an OVA package. For Xen server and VMware, and an XVA only for Xen server. So the XVA is smaller, but it took three and a half minutes to import for me on my old home office environment. So no need to think about it. What I did here, due to memory limitations, I sent it down to one gig of RAM. And the first thing you have to do is when having started the virtual appliance, specifying an IP address, subnet, gateway. And that's all you are doing normally in the console. After this, you, connect, you are connecting to a, a, a GUI-based console just by using the browser, pointing to um, the HTTPS IP address. And uh, further configuration is done just by, by using your browser, connect to your Active Directory, importing the certificates, um, specifying your Exchange um, server, email addresses, and so on. Hast du mal hier Pier das? Do you know the IP address? 10, 20, 30, 40? Yes. Okay. Access Gateway okay. Standard, yes. And the console is from Access Gateway Standard. So, okay. okay. <laughs> Not the web based GUI, but the initial configuration of, of the machine. <coughs> so, let's just log in with admin as username. And the default password is password. I do express setup. I just specify the IP address, which is on the 22. Um, the subnet mask specifies the default gateway. Specify my DNS server, which is in my case a domain controller. And even a reliable time source. Mm -hmm. Oops, not 
contained Mid changes, reboot, and that's all you are doing normally in the console. So it's really a one minute setup. And after this, you're ready to go to log into your browser, or with your browser, into the web GUI. There you can see that we are using the database under the hood. What flavor? PostgreSQL. Something you have to specify on the console. It's a separate port. If you don't specify it, you get to the store web page. Because you can use even the app controller standalone without talking services. For example, if the customer does not have Sandbox and desktop in its environment and only want to, like to use mobile app management, web SaaS apps, you just can use uh, the app controller standalone and plan with all having the need to install software services separately. That's the URL, it's directly redirecting me to store web. That's um, the same website we previously used with storefront services, but it's not configured so it can complete the request. So if I would have configured my, um, my LDAP bind, my applications, the user can be just log on normally with, with domain credentials and get access to, to the web to SAS, uh, and even to the mobile apps. In our case, we would like to configure it. So what is be best practice? Go to the web interface, of course, go to the point. Um, go to storefront. storefront. Yeah. Because currently, in the current implementation, not every feature provided by storefront services <coughs> is implemented um, into the app controller. But that's something we are currently working on it. For example, the secure ticket authority feature, mm -hmm. what we need with external access, is currently not implemented, but it will hopefully implement it in the next release so that we can even use only the app controller without having um, um, having the need for, for installing storefront services. So there will be a web interface appliance? Some kind of. <laughs> okay. You will see it later when we configure the appliance, you will see uh, you have to configure trust, app controller standalone, mm -hmm. storefront services, access gateway, and, and therefore. So there is not admin, there is administrator. This is the administrator. Handy. Also with password as a default. And after the initial lockdown, it will come up with wizard. So it's all wizard driven for the initial configuration, requesting the, the necessary information for get the appliance up and running. So it's quite <coughs> asking for the current password, which is password, the new password, which is one two three. It breaks one two three. The administrator email address.
and it's asking for the host name, which is the FQDN um, with corresponding corresponding certificate, certificate providing the common name. The IP address submit address the suffix for the resource conf. That's it. Take the directory server, which is ADS01. Dot training dot local. And as we have not already imported the root certificate of the domain or the, the, the domain controller certificate, we can only use unsecure connection to um, the domain controller. But that's something you can change diff, uh, directly after the initial configuration by just importing the root certificate of your domain and then switching it to port uh, 636 for secure LDAP. The domain name is training dot correct The there's a nice feature, autofill for the base DN. <laughs> so you're binding that to the domain controller, not the root domain, correct? So that's, you've put the domain controller in there, in that configuration? Just one domain controller? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's only one domain controller in, uh, at this stage. And um, So what if that domain controller goes down? Yeah, problem. So yes. that's what I'm saying. It yes, should yes. down to the domain root, not, not a server. Okay. Uh, you have to specify a server, and currently there can only be specified one server in the 2.0 release. But you can, if you, you normally you have to use Netscape or Escape Enterprise, and so you can load balance oh, your, your LWP requests okay. to multiple domain yeah. controllers. Uh, so it can, it can be you like your Netscape? Yeah. You must have one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <And> load balance. <laughs> yeah. Checks the price list. Yeah. It's all Netscape. <laughs> I think the PSG group. <laughs> PSG group. <laughs> <laughs> so, Europe. Now it's kind of sorted. In the earlier releases, uh, you have to search somewhere slightly above the middle, and you found Berlin, for example. There was no uh, yeah, sort of yeah, the sort on the on the sort on, on, on Europe and horror. US, and then yeah. that's it. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, like <laughs> in almost every Berlin's product. <laughs> and there it's pretty good. So it's too low. Yes, you have all the power on the Wi-Fi, so you can't help it. I kicked a couple of guys out already, so... Planning local. Summary. You can check all the things you entered in the background. Do a reboot and that's it. That's for the initial configuration. So if you enter port 363 there and you don't have upload certificate already, it tells you that you can't contact the exit directly. Okay, but we are not done with the initial configuration because we did not import any certificates for the service certificate for the appliance, for the service certificate, and even the root certificate. So Active Directory has been configured, um, and then afterwards you can specify that you would like to use a secure connection to it. The trust settings is very important because currently the appliance is running in standalone mode, only for the internal network. If it should be also available for the external users, you have to specify NetScaler, so that the NetScaler is standing in front of the app controller. In our case, what we will do is that the app controller is just another content controller for a storefront. So we will marry it with the storefront services and just provide the same information on storefront services that we would like to use the app controller as another content controller, the same thing that we did, did previously for Xenet. After this, um, the managed receiver updates will also be grayed out because 
the receiver management is done by storefront services, which is standing in front of it. Certificates is one of the first steps you should definitely do because the certificate is not um, self-generated during the initial um, startup. It's just put into the appliance and it's the same across all appliances. That means, for example, if uh, a customer is using the self-generated certificate for a similar request, and you are importing the same appliance, there is only one appliance, and they're using the same certificate, and you, you, you know the username, you can possibly hack into their account. So that's something, one of the first steps you should definitely do, change the SAML certificate. Trusted, here we will import the root certificate. Service certificate. Last step will be to just import the SAML certificate, which is the same as the service certificate. So we are importing the service certificate twice, just specifying that we would like to use it as one time as service certificate and the other time as um, SAML certificate. So summit certificate, you will see containing the private key. It's an open source tool which is based on OpenSSL, so you don't need all the command line options and just can click on it. So from front end to OpenSSL is pretty cool. You can uh, create signing requests, you can create okay. private keys, you can link it, you can um, import and export, convert to several formats. It's really cool. So I always say okay. plus key. We'll export it into the right directory. Okay, 
let's double check it. successfully imported into our controller. Same thing for the summer certificate. You can use the same certificate for server for summer. After having imported the summer certificate, you can see that the default summer certificate will expire and that it, it will be wiped out. So this is now. Uh, made the summit certificate and the only thing we now need to do is just to bind the um, correct server certificate to the appliance and make it active and then it will lock me out because it's now binding the new certificate to it. I can now even lock on by specifying the QDM based on um, which is the same as the certificate. Corresponding port. On security warning. Let's talk about the administrator again. There is uh, nearly a put the signed password. And the last thing would be to clean it up, which means to delete the old default certificate. So, done. This is all of the initial configuration. Now we can change the directory or do you have more to secure no. communication? Yes, we can now change the active directory because we own the root certificate specifying port 636, make it secure, just re-enter <coughs> the password. Save. And we can directly check if the configuration is right and working by refreshing the information from Active Directory. That means that now he's trying to connect to, to the main controller and pulling the corresponding fields into the Postgres SQL database posted on the appliance. And here's the success message. In, in 2.0, it's a very important feature to refresh the Active Directory. It does not do this automatically. If you, if you change to Active Directory, changing groups or doing similar stuff, uh, it will not check uh, automatically in Active Directory for the changes, but you have to refresh it manually or wait until 2 p.m. Uh, 2 a.m. So overnight it will do it automatically, but if you do it during the day, just go and uh, refresh from Active Directory. So this is only done once a night at 2 a.m. as uh, Ron mentioned. So any changes or to, to, to reflect in any changes uh, in your Active Directory structure, you have to re refresh it. So the next step will be to um, add a role, and the role is normally based on my um, Active Directory group. You can even see here that the groups are enumerated right in real time, and we can put, for example, a group in there and just call it group 3, and that's based on group 3. 
be sales or engineering or whatever. Just put in there group four. The science corresponding ID group to it. And then you can start creating applications or assign existing application templates to the corresponding roles. As you can see, we have the apps, and there are a lot of applications predefined, especially or nearly every Citrix web-based application like Volatil, the old online division is represented there, or even um, if you would like to log on to my Citrix. <coughs> And that's a pre-configured template with the corresponding URL in there. We just assign it, for example, to all the members of group three. Save. And this can be done with all the pre-configured templates. So, if I got a web or SaaS app which is not pre-configured, how can I get it to work? That's quite easy. Let's say, for example, um, I have a company card. And the company car is provided by a lease company. So we got a, a portal from a company called Lease Plan. <coughs> and in this portal, I have to do everything. For example, if I have an accident, a crash, I have to reorder a new car, I, would, um, I need something, maintenance. I have to, to, to put in an online request. And there I have to put in my username, my password, and then press the login. And the only thing I need to do for this application is grab the URL, define a new enterprise app, I say lease plan, fleet management, and put in there the URL. Assign it to a role, for example, all the SEs and sales stuff as a company car. And I even can upload an icon, a different icon. I use the default icon. And when clicking on save, the appliance is trying to contact lease plan and passing all the content of the website, getting the information there. I have to put in the username and the password. And as you can see, already created the, the, the web and SaaS app um, and it, it finds information. So it can be done quite easily. I just provided the URL, for example, for American Express, for um, British Petrol or, or everything you would like to use from a web or SaaS app. And um, the only complicated thing is, for example, if the application is not programmed right. For example, you have two forms in the website. Then you have to set it up manually or ask the, tickets, uh, the Citrix support for providing the information. Yeah. The last thing that I would like to show you is how to connect the content controller um, to storefront services. And that's quite easy. The only thing we have to do here is to define the trust settings, edit. Storefront, specify the load balance storefront URL. Save. It's a nightmare. Going back to the storefront controller. Yeah. 
about it. It's the internet. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, manage delivery controllers and specify that we would like to add the app controller as another content controller for our web and SaaS apps. And here I'm specifying uh, uh, so the FQDN, FC, Mulas, and dot local. And if you would like to use a data folder, then we share a file, and that's it. If you now log on to your Stockman services, you see the additional icons of the web and SaaS applications or mobile applications if you have uploaded them uh, and can present them to the users uh, through the service yeah. That's all. Okay, so I think it's time for the next presenter. Sorry. So, um, if you would like to sh see how the mobile apps work and um, how we will work with the next release, you can show it to you outside uh, and even demo it on the iPad or on the Android device with secure web, um, secure email. So, if you have any further questions, please feel free to contact us directly today or I think that also the information how to contact us is available uh, or made available by Alex. And um, we would be happy to help you if you, there are any further questions regarding Cloud Gateway App Controller Stuff and Services. So, thanks very much for your time. And um, I hope we can give you an outlook what will be possible with Cloud Controller today and um, even the more coming things with the next release of uh, Cloud Gateway.